And we're back on the Y'all Show. John Rawl here. Good to have you aboard as we're going to do something that we haven't done in a little while on Y'all. And we're going to put it on our history cap and learn some Southern history, specifically about the war. The War of Southern Independence, the Civil War, the War of Northern Aggression. You can call it what you want. We have a very special guest that's coming on right now to help us understand understand the Atlanta campaign and what was happening with the Army of Tennessee. And this author, a Civil War author of many books, has a new book coming out in just a few weeks that's going to be all about General John Bell Hood. And we welcome in from the Atlanta area Stephen Davis to the program as he is an alumnus of Emory and UNC. He had his master's at UNC. He went back to Emory to get his Ph.D., And Stephen Davis is now on the Y'all Show to talk some Civil War history. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. John, thank you. My pleasure. Kudos on all your academia. (laughs) It's simply a function of time and money. Time and money. You don't get free money to go study the Civil War? Not not even here in the American South. No, no. But it's a very important time and a very important part of the Southern story, and that's why we've got Dr. Davis on with us here on the Y'all program to talk about his many books. So first of all, welcome in, but secondly, how in the world did you get involved with studying and writing about the Civil War? Thanks, John. I've mused about this a long time. I know, of course, that I became a Civil Warrior in the fourth grade, 57, 58. I don't know if that's when I was taken by my parents to the cyclorama, maybe Kennesaw Mountain, but you know what I really think? I think it was The Grey Ghost, the CBS 30-minute Civil War costume drama about John Singleton Mosby that began airing in 57, 58 on Wednesday evenings at 7.30. I think that turned me on to the war. They did a good job, and I can I can certainly relate because of the youngster, a show called Baba Black Sheep, the Black Sheep's oh, yeah, yeah. aired, and that got me interested in World War II history, and then it wasn't long after that that my grandparents took me to Fort Sumter, and I became a big-time Civil War buff. So it's very important how books and media can contribute to youngsters having a little bit more interest in what has happened here in American history. Very important. Your first Civil War book, what led you to write that, and what was its name? It's entitled um, Atlanta Will Fall, Sherman, Joe Johnston, and the Yankee Heavy Battalions. I was uh, put in contact with a publisher by a friend, Steve Woodworth, who still teaches at TCU, I believe, and they wanted a 200-page survey of the war. This is 1999. Now, of course, Castell had, in 92, put out uh, um, um, his big book um, on the Atlanta campaign, but but they wanted a a shorter summary. So in 200 pages, I kind of packed the story. And between Castell and my shorter narrative, there's there's a big yawning gap because people sometimes want to read a lot, or they want to take a book to the beach. Makes sense. And as I said at the start of this interview, Stevens done a little bit, a little bit different type deal with his book writing career. Most, if not all, your books have all centered on the Army of Tennessee and the March of Georgia and such. And if you if you know a little bit about Civil War history, and I I claim to be one of those that knows a little bit. Actually, I think I know a lot. It, we're talking year 1864. Chickamauga was 63. I guess that all September flows. September 63. Yeah, all that kind of flows. And what I don't understand is that Chickamauga was technically a Confederate victory. But even oh, though the. Uh, awesomely so. But how in the world could the Confederates win that battle in at the end of 63 and then end up losing the march toward Atlanta? They even won Kennesaw Mountain. That was a victory by the South. And the the Yankees, if you will, still found a way to keep on trucking and keep. ultimately they got the victory. 
Well, that's that's the reason for my subtitle, In Atlanta Will Fall. Um, a Confederate newspaperman who wrote under the pen name of Shadow, Henry Watterson, wrote a column for a, a Mobile paper circa May 21, three weeks into the campaign, two weeks into the campaign. And he said, I'm not a military man, but I see that Sherman is a smart tactician. Joe Johnston has a predilection for retreat and there are too many Yankees against us. So those were the three reasons that he predicted Atlanta will fall. And John, that was May 21. Hmm. Two weeks into the campaign. And all those three factors caused the uh, collapse of the Confederate defense after President Davis fired Joe Johnston and elevated John Bell Hood to Army Command. And when was that fire? Uh, July 17th, 18th, when the Yankees were five miles outside of Atlanta. Ah, okay. Uh, and, and there you have it, the... A lot of this, again, if you studied Civil War history, the President Jefferson Davis, many connections he had prior to the war and his friendships may not have always been in the best interest of success on the battlefield. Is that also what was at play here in the Army of Tennessee? Yes. Um, Jeff, da Jeff Davis spent the winter of 63-64 in Richmond with Hood, who was convalescing from his amputation wound at Chickamauga. So the president knew uh, Hood personally and went to church at St. Paul's with him. Um, and by that time, of course, Hood was a Confederate legend, having been a division and corps commander uh, for Lee at Gaines Mill, his charge broke the Yankee line, second Manassas, Sharpsburg, and again at Gettysburg. And again, he had his arm amputated and leg amputated too, right? He had lost the use of his left arm. Okay. Uh, a shell uh, burst in the opening minutes of the attack, 4 p.m. July 2nd, uh, against the Yankee left and Hood was taken out of the battle. But the, the, wound, the wound did not require amputation. He simply lost the use of much, m most of the use of the arm. But the, the, his right leg caught a ball at Chickamauga in the charge of the second day, and that had to be amputated in, in the upper third. We know that ultimately John Bell Hood would lead the Southern Army and the book Into Tennessee and Failure. You're looking at a copy of the cover of that from Stephen Davis. Great looking cover there and a great read there. This is out, by the way, if you want to pick up your own copy of that, you can go and pre-order from Mercer University Press is where this book is found along with other great titles and your theme in volume one was the ambition that John Bell Hood drove to seek higher and higher rank. And ultimately he got to be the head of the army of Tennessee, as we said, and Atlanta falls, John Bell Hood's leading this Confederate army in the March to Savannah, your book, evidently this particular book that's coming out into Tennessee and failure. That's about post Atlanta and a, a, an effort to try to divert attention back toward Nashville and more, correct? Correct, yes, the Tennessee campaign. Well, what I found interesting is two things. One, President Davis visited Hood about three weeks after the fall of the city, and they reviewed their options, which were very few. Uh, Davis, therefore, in my view, uh, approved, talked with Hood about the Tennessee campaign and approved it. There are two sources for this, both Dick Taylor and Braxton Bragg, who within weeks opposed Hood's advance into Tennessee. But at least we know from the contemporary evidence that Davis was talking about the Tennessee campaign with both Dick Taylor and Braxton Bragg. The second item that is less well known is that circa September 19th, about three weeks after the fall of the city, General Lee wrote President Davis 
and recommended that he relieve Hood and replace him with G.T. Beauregard as commander of the Army of Tennessee. I had Davis, never, heard that. I never heard of that. Yeah, well, catch this, John. It's in the official records of the Civil War. Even McMurray, in his biography of Hood in 82, does not mention it. It's as if you come upon it in the OR. What? What's this letter from R.E. Lee asking that Beauregard be appointed to command that army, as Lee repeatedly said? And it's as if McMurray came upon it in the OR, couldn't figure it out, and turned the page. I, I wrote a, an article about it for Dana Schoff in Civil War Times, who didn't know about it either. Jeez. Now, a lot of the thought about John Bell Hood at the time was, yes, he was certainly a hero after all the battle wounds and more, a Texan leading the Army of Tennessee at this point. But there was a, a certain belief that John Bell Hood, things just weren't quite right with him. When he had been gravely wounded like he had, perhaps it was the medicine or, or something else that he was making decisions that just didn't make sense. And that would certainly come to play at a battle like the Battle of Franklin, where untold numbers of Confederates lost their lives in, in rushes against the Union line. And this was a battle fought completely at nighttime. I know this is covered in your book. Your thoughts on the mental the ability of John Bell Hood after it was evident that something wasn't quite right with the general? Well, I might take issue with you, John, okay. in deference. In fact, about 20 years ago for Blue and Gray magazine, my publisher allowed me to write an extended essay on because I grew up reading the secondary literature that Hood, because of his Chickamauga amputation, um, had been addicted and and excessively used laudanum or other opiates as a means of addressing his post-amputative pain. Well, you know what? I went through the primary literature and I found not one contemporaneous observation of Hood doping. In, in, in fact, it came, I traced it to a 1929 biography of Ewell by Percy Hamlin, who supposed that Hood used uh, opiates. And I went through the secondary literature, and it's filled with speculation and subjunctives. If Hood, Hood might have, Hood could have. That's no basis of besmirching a general's reputation. So I, since that time, um, my side of the argument seems to have held sway. On the Franklin decision, however, just today I gave a Zoom presentation comparing and contrasting, catch this, Hood's attack uh, at Franklin November 30th and Lee's decision on the third day of Gettysburg to commit to a frontal assault. Actually, if you look at it, Hood had better chances, albeit both attacks were pretty well doomed to failure, Hood tactically had more chance of success at Franklin than Lee did on the third day of Gettysburg. Lee's reputation, however, is un unbesmirched. Hood has been consigned to infamy. I think that's a bum, a bum rap. My apologies. That's why we have you on this show to talk about things like that. And it's also why, frankly, if you know anything about Civil War history, Although the last shots of the Civil War rang out over 160 years ago, we know now that people still are captivated by the war. You have books written by people like Stephen Davis that continue to sell well. You've got artwork, some of that right there on display behind Stephen there at his office. And people are still infatuated with the war between the states. In fact, they're still battling over the causes of the Civil War. Exactly. I call it the war, the war against Yankee perfidy. I was in Franklin a few years ago preparing to give a talk, went out to dinner with my hosts, and uh, a, a new acquaintance told me that at his workplace, his manager came up to him and said, why do you call me a Yankee? He said, I don't call you a rebel. And my friend at the dinner table said, 
I wish you would. <laughs> it's just that we have, we don't get over it down here. They can't figure it out. I understand. I understand. And I know this isn't exactly a political book that you're writing, but we are talking here in 2020 when we've seen another assault on Confederate symbolism and, and more. Is John Bell Hood, he's the cover of your new book, it is, are there statues of him anywhere? What's been the overall uh, revisionist history of John Bell Hood? And, and growing up in Atlanta, uh, Atlanta in the centennial years was Joe Johnston's town. The, history, uh, the Atlanta Historical Society uh, was all pro Joe Johnston. You can see that in the plaques that they sponsored at uh, Tanyard Creek Park, et cetera. But in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, led by Castell, McMurray, even Connolly, John Bell Hood gets a better view uh, amongst historians. And I would like to say that especially with President Davis approving the Tennessee campaign and with Hood running out of options at both Franklin and Nashville, Hood did the best he could. Um, it, it, it ended up, of course, a tragic failure, hence the title of my new book. All right, Into All right. Tennessee and Failure. It's from author Stephen Davis, and you can get your copy again coming out on Mercer University Press. You can go to Amazon, order your digital copy and more, and he's got a whole line of Civil War-related books, and you can check them all out there as he has just a, a plethora of books. He's written articles for Civil War magazines and more, doing Zoom call meetings and so much more, Stephen Davis. Stephen, what's the best way for people to order the book and or to reach out to you if they have questions or anything regarding Civil War research and more? And John, I'm reading Raphael Sims' Memoirs of Service Afloat, and here I am in my lower level library, and I quote Admiral Sims when he says, when mobs rule, gentlemen must retire to private quarters. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks and goodbye from the basement of Shea Davis. Shea, all right. I like it. What, what's the best place for people to get your book? Where, where uh, yeah, Mercer uh, University Press online. Maybe even Amazon. I don't know. Hey, thank you for your time and best of luck with Into Tennessee and Failure from author Stephen Davis. Thank you, John. My pleasure. All right. More of the Y'all Show continues after this timeout.